James, welcome. Um, can I introduce James, who has an interesting background in games, in Nintendo, I believe, and then Tate, the Tate Gallery, and Google Arts Project, and now Google Cultural Institute. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of a multidisciplinary background <laughs> uh, with you know, significant digital elements. So I think, I think today we can, I can talk about some of the activities of the Google Cultural Institute, about what we're up to, what our plans are. It's kind of an umbrella organization that houses uh, various different pilot projects that um, uh, Google has sort of began because they were interested in certain aspects of culture. Yeah. May, they may have been interested in art, um, interested in technology and how that can be applied to art, interested in history and so on. So the art project, which is one of those and one of the biggest examples, we also did a large project with um, a museum in uh, Jerusalem around the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've done archives around um, the Holocaust. We've sent Street View to ancient landmarks around the world. So all of these things came from people at Google who wanted to do something really cool with Google technology and culture. Now we've kind of have this umbrella organization, the Cultural Institute, that houses them and that we're beginning to integrate them and make more sense of them. Um, but if it, if it works, yes, yeah, so we have a, move out of the way. a couple of quick videos about what we're doing. First of all, about the art project. So I'd hope, I'd hope to be able to demo that, but you can see that it's kind of an experiential uh, type product where we want to get a little bit closer to what happens between uh, you and an artwork when you're in a, a gallery environment. The, our history related project in the Cultural Institute, which we can show the next video, is more educational and learning. The aim of the Cultural Institute is to preserve and promote culture online, make it accessible to the world. We're working with curators and historians and experts to create stories around all that material. Steve Biko was a banned person. He was not allowed to be quoted. He couldn't publish anything and his image could not be printed in the newspaper. He didn't really take no for an answer. He always questioned the why behind the way things happened. He actually developed solutions to help overcome some of the challenges imposed by apartheid, both at the structural level of the state as well as the individual level within communities. We believe that in our country there shall be no minority, there shall be no majority, there shall just be people. One highlight would have to be the whole manuscript of what Nelson Mandela meant to be the sequel to Long Walk to Freedom. He never finished it, but we've got about 10 chapters in various forms. It's just unbelievably powerful. There are many pictures and video fragments of friends of Anne, pictures of her diary, and of course pictures of Anne's room. The only moving pictures of Anne, a uh, film footage of, I think, seven seconds. It's really very dear material to us, and I'm very happy that we could put that also on the website. The story of uh, Elek Galinski and Malacy Medbaum, a Polish young man and uh, a Jewish young woman who met at Auschwitz in Birkenau, fell in love 
and uh, they decided to escape. But unfortunately they were captured and uh, sent back to the camp. It tells you that even in such uh, hell as Auschwitz, uh, there were real human beings with real feelings and emotions. The internet is really a powerful tool. We've been recognizing that for quite a long time. Everyone can profit from sharing information, sharing materials with other partners. It makes material available in a way that would otherwise not be available. This could become one of those fundamental instruments that, that all of us use. I'm just going to swap chairs with you yeah, because sure. I understand it's better if I sit over here. Good. So would you like to tell us a little bit more about the uh, kind of editorial framework, how you've chosen the projects that, um, that you currently run? Okay, so that um, that's really gets to the heart of what we're doing, where um, we have all this, uh, we, we work with amazing partners around the world. There's incredible content, um, and, but Google is a technology company. So this is a fantastic question, sort of what editorial or curatorial activity do we engage with? And the answer is absolutely as little as possible. Mm -hmm. Google are not experts in, uh, in the cultural sector, but we work with experts in the cultural sector. So in every case and in every way possible, we take a lead from our partners, from our curators, on what is appropriate, what's the right thing to say, how it should be said, how this material should be gathered together. Um, we are a technology company, and even though it contains um, people who are culturally savvy or who come from the cultural sector, it's absolutely not our role. Uh, we want to provide you know, an empowering platform and collaborative tools for those in the cultural sector to share their expertise with the public. So I suppose the question then is, how do you choose your partners, and what's the, what's the future for your partnerships? OK, so this is... Um, this comes from a very kind of practical um, idea that we choose the partners who are interested in working with us. So some partners come and ask us, can we come and work with you? And we have a, a small set of rules around we um, don't necessarily want to work with a commercial organization that is, um, wants to work with us to make money because the entire activity of the Cultural Institute is absolutely non-commercial and it's a non-profit part of Google, so we don't slap advertising anywhere. It's not, nothing like that. So that's kind of an instant uh, no to those kinds of things. Everywhere else, it's about um, our understanding of what culture is. It's expanding our pilot projects, such as the art project, to work with other art museums around the world. So it's a combination of letting people know that these platforms are available, um, having people come to us, and in some cases, we go to them where there's an obvious match. Can I just press a little bit more? Uh, are your partnerships related to any digitization programs you have with those institutions, or is it in independent of that relationship? Um, absolutely independent. So um, uh, we don't en uh, engage in digitization activity per se, <coughs> excuse me, for the, um, for the Cultural Institute projects. In instead, we um, uh, work with partners where digitized content is already available, but it doesn't necessarily have a great home. Mm. Um, or we can offer another home for it. And with that home, there's a new platform, and with that platform, we think there is a new audience. And this is where I kind of want to get to the heart of what I feel that we're offering, which is really a brand new audience um, that's potentially much larger than the audience who might physically go to a location. Yes. Um, it contains lots of people who will never be able to go to those physical locations, but can still engage with that cultural content in some way or form and be inspired by it. So, so what do you know about the audience? We know that the audience, I, I, I know that the audience is extremely large and I believe that the audience is much bigger um, than is often thought of in the cultural sector. Um, I think that the audience for visual art is, um, like everybody likes sunsets, okay? I've never met anyone who doesn't like a sunset. So therefore, I think that logically, I could present a painting of a sunset to you as a sunset lover, and it turns out then you're actually liking art, even though you didn't feel that you liked art. And I feel this is the same across every cultural domain, that you can uh, show theater to people, um, various aspects of performance art, design, architecture, history, um, to those who feel that they weren't interested in it, that it might be, they might think of it as a boring topic because they have some memory that it was boring at school, um, but when you present it to them in an engaging way or through a new and surprising platform, 
um, then I feel that the audience for that is absolutely, uh, you know, it's global and it's everybody. Can you put any figures on that? Um, well, for digital, it's everyone who is online. It's everyone who has access to a device that can access cultural content online. Yeah. And uh, what about the technology that you're currently using, and how do you see that developing over the next few years? So the technologies that we use so far are, um, well, we have a kind of set of HTML5-based web technologies for the main platforms that you can see online at the Cultural Institute, the Art Project, the Wonders of the World, etc. cetera. Um, and these are great, and they contain certain innovations. Um, we also have a set of physical technologies that we use, um, things like Street View, that we might take into an amazing uh, building such as this, and to um, photograph it in 3D and convert that into a, an experience that you can view online. Um, so we combine web and physical technologies um, together to provide um, you know, compelling experiences. We um, still don't yet have a great mobile offering, but this is, on, you know, this is absolutely on our roadmap and this is coming soon. We've been so sensitive to the notions around creating a very compelling and very rich experience around culture that, of course, Compelling and rich is very hard to do when you're restricted to something that is mobile and uh, portable. But we're getting there, and we have some fantastic ideas around that. But our next phase towards the longer term, towards these technologies, is about uh, developing tools and services and, and APIs that enable organizations across the world to um, use our platform, but in ways without necessarily being hosted by it to use parts of our platform on their, on their own site. Um, so for example, we have an amazing tool to create online exhibits at the moment that you caught a glimpse of in the, in the video. It's a very easy to use tool. It's kind of drag and drop um, with, with images and text. But we already have a system whereby you can syndicate that tool to host that content on, uh, to display that content on your own site. And we'll do the hosting for you. So we're really keen to be able to take our tools and services and then spread them out and not just aggregate them into one central place. We have a fantastic, rich central place, but it's equally important that if you go to a, muse a museum's website that's the other side of the world that you're not necessarily associated with Google, but if that museum is able to uh, use some of our tools and services to um, enrich their own platform, then that's an absolutely a big win for us and that is the direction that we're heading. So what would be your message to some of the organizations that are represented here today, James, in terms of their potential involvement in something like the Google Cultural Institute? Um, well, first of all, is that, that our, our doors are always open and we're very happy to talk to everybody. But I don't necessarily want to kind of sit here and um, sell it to everybody because I just think it's a great platform and, it's, uh, and I'm sure others would hopefully agree. But I think there are certain challenges that we directly address, and, and others do too, but are relevant to everyone. Um, the first is around audiences, and, it, and it's around the kind of the perception of who your audience is. Mm. And I, I, do, I do feel that if you, um, if you want to convert your digital audience into physical visitors, then this is, um, you're, you're inherently kind of limiting who your audience is, that you really need to kind of break free of this idea that there absolutely must be a bridge between physical and digital. It's really useful to have a bridge. Um, it's a fantastic transition to make. But once you break free of this notion that digital visitors must be converted to physical one way or another, you suddenly expand your idea of who your audience is. Um, you can then go global. And this is particularly true for smaller and more specialist organizations who may, of course, struggle to get people physically through the door but once they can use uh, global online platforms, the struggle is much less, and there are far more interesting ways to get far bigger audiences digitally. And it turns out, once you have that bigger audience digitally, plenty of those will actually try to come to your physical location, um, so you can cater for them automatically. I suppose the next question is around, uh, the next challenge is around funding, which of course is gonna be a topic that pops up a lot today and that many, many of us are here to discuss. I think particularly for funding, um, if you look at the last 15 years, one interesting um, kind of trend is how, um, how what people have asked for money for 
has changed, where 15 years ago, there was a very basic idea that you would ask for money for digitizing your collection, and that was that. This is now much more difficult to, uh, to get funding for, and I feel rightly so, because you can, you can kind of over-digitize your content, and then you don't know what to do with it, or what you're going to do next, or where it's going to go. And you can commit yourself to a particular platform um, without um, a long-term view in mind. So I think one of the key questions is about what do I need this money for? I, is there a more innovative way that I can use this money? Can I share this, you know, can I share this, um, uh, what I'm aiming to do with someone else? And this leads me to the kind of third challenge, which is really around collaboration. Um, I think that everyone in the room um, uh, agrees with the, the, the kind of the lofty notion that collaboration is a holy grail and we should all be collaborating more and better. In practice, this has proven very difficult to achieve because we're from, um, you know, we have different quirks in our given sector. Some organizations are actual rivals to us, to each other in the physical space. But when you get into digital, that, those rivalries can disappear. Um, the quirks between the sectors um, can disappear too. In the, uh, our incentive with the, um, with the Cultural Institute projects, with the art project and so on, is to head towards integration, even though they come from very different places. And I think that integration is really an example of collaboration across the sector. It's people from different kinds of organizations working together, but still exhibiting the sensitivity required of a given cultural vertical. Yeah. You know, visual art has its own particular needs that differ greatly from design or from performance and so on. So you can still be sensitive um, uh, to those particular requirements, but collaborate much more easily online. So for me, really, it's about the audience and who they are. It's about funding and what you really need funding for. And it's about collaboration and how using digital platforms, collaboration can be achieved more easily. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm really struck by the notion of over-digitization, by the way, something we ought to note down and prepare for. Okay. But um, on the question of collaboration, James, um, I mean, some of the organizations involved here and working with Nesta and the Arts Council and the, the R&D Fund are really quite small organizations um, working around very specific areas of activity. Uh, perhaps they're wary of working with such a massive giant in the digital sphere as Google. Okay. What, what would you say to those kinds of concerns and, uh, and how would you address them? Well, I can, I can appreciate those concerns, I can see where they come from. From the outside, Google can appear monolithic, um, it's hugely financially successful. Um, from the inside, it's very different, it is a fun place to work, all those articles about everything are, are true. And it's, it's worth saying that all of our cultural projects, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, came from people who worked at Google, who were committed to doing something, who had a particular interest in that. So in the Cultural Institute, it's full of people like me who are passionate about culture. These projects began in uh, people's volunteer time, so they weren't getting paid to do this stuff, they wanted to do it outside of that. And it's full of people like me who want to, you know, who are passionate about the arts, who are passionate about design, about culture in its various forms. Second is that contractually, all of our projects are non-profit, they're non-commercial. There are no financial transactions that take place. So there's nothing, there's no kind of hidden agenda of what we're going to do. And there's a very low barrier to entry in terms of you don't need to be a large or, or weighty organization. Um, third is that we, because we've already catered for, from the smallest to the largest organizations, we've worked with museums in India who um, their metadata was actually pieces of paper that were in a basement. Um, so we worked with them about their own digitization program, about what that was going to be, um, got, helped get some of their content online. And then, you know, you can, as a small organization, you can be showcased on a larger platform more easily simply through virtue of serendipity, through being able to wander through the content, follow, you know, follow your nose, see what your interests are, and go to the big names if you want, but go to the smaller ones too. One of my favorite organizations in the art project is called the Ayala Museum in the Philippines. Um, this museum has, uh, it's about Philippine history. The objects in the museum are absolutely incredible. The objects in the museum are made by the museum staff over several decades, and they are wooden dioramas of Philippine history, 
that are extremely kind of exotic and sumptuous and wonderful. And this is such a kind of non-traditional collection that you can't imagine. How on earth is there a museum where everything in the museum is made by people who work there? But when you look at this stuff, it makes perfect sense. It's such a wonderful organization to work with. Um, I, I, I was fortunate to meet a couple of the people who work there. There's only about four people who work there. And, you know, that's an example of a small organization that's achieved great success through working with us because they can share a platform, uh, you know, with Tate and MoMA and some of the larger organizations in the world. Great. Um, can I ask you about how all these facets of work in Google fit together now and will fit together in the future? I'm thinking of the art project, cultural, Google Cultural Institute, and indeed the Google search engine. How do you see these working together in the future? Um, well, the first two are different from the third yes. one. <laughs> so the first two are an example of our cultural projects, and there are, and there are many more. And as I say, these um, are heading towards integration so that we can right. provide a more unified cultural experience. Currently, they exist rather in silos in the way that many of our, our projects that we've all worked on in the room um, are siloed. So we're trying to de-silo them as, as best and as sensitively as we can. Now, uh, Google does hundreds of other things, such as the search engine, um, such as social media and so on. Each of them are you know, successful or less so in their own right. Uh, many of them are commercial, many of them are not. So we have a very strict line in the Cultural Institute where, uh, that we draw between our involvement, you know, there are, there are loads of cool things that Google does, but because they're commercial, we um, are very careful about getting involved with them. So we don't want this material to kind of seep out and to suddenly be available in a okay. commercial channel. Okay. So we draw a very strict line, and it's, it's, uh, it's in our contracts, and it's very important to us because we recognize the value in keeping that division. So what are the um, overarching ambitions of the Google Cultural Institute? In other words, how do you see the definition of culture that you want to embrace within this spread of work? Well, I want, I want it to be the home of culture online. Um, one of the places where you can go to to find answers to the question of what should, wh what's performance art going to do online? What is, what is interesting other than live streaming uh, for things like that? Um, to be able to uh, to cross domains between art, design, history, other aspects of culture very fluidly and very easily, and to be able to leverage all of the amazing cultural uh, products and services and activity that happens in partner organization where our tools are hopefully responsible for making some of that better. So our long-term aim is not just about making a really broad and really deep and really engaging home for culture, it's also about um, enabling many thousands or hundreds of thousands of homes for culture using technology that Google is uniquely able to provide. So that technology spin-off you see as a main, a key asset in collaborating? A absolutely, the because the, you know, in, 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 um, in the kind of medium term, I'd be absolutely delighted if people aren't engaged in cultural activity on the Google Cultural Institute, but they're engaged in it elsewhere using some of the cool tools and products and services that we've developed uh, behind the scenes and that are enriching those experiences. So that, for all of us who work in the Cultural Institute, is a goal that we can um, you know, empower these experiences using our technology. Uh, we don't necessarily want people to come to Google and have a Google logo in the corner and to Googleize everything. Right. We, we, we're really keen on empowering others through our technology because Google is a technology company and we'll leave cultural expertise and experience to others best place for that. Great. Well, thank you very much, James, for that insight into the Google Cultural Institute. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.